Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. In clubs, I'd make eye contact with another big guy because we were always taller than the rest. I sort of knew, I was like, okay, this guy wants to go. So it's like, you know, you sort of just look at each other and then it's like, want to go? You want to go? And it's like, okay, let's go. And then, so it was always that silent agreement of like, okay, yeah, it's going to happen. Let's do this. So, yeah, wow. yeah, I guess I'm lucky in that sense. So when that would happen in the, in the club, you know, I've experienced that, but not quite like, you guys i'm not as clearly as big as you i'm a basketball player but i'm not a big basketball player <laughs> um you know when you would look at somebody like that would the fight happen there or is it kind of a silent agreement uh, we're, we're going to take this outside both wherever it's right. like are you ready now <laughs> yeah well it's like should we take this downstairs so yeah yeah you mentioned earlier about the the biker family, uh, the biker world. Uh, did you ever contemplate going in the biker world? Yeah, I did. Bike world. Yeah. Yeah, over here I did. Yeah, um, I've got a fair few mates in that world, and when I was looking into it, when I was planning on putting a foot into that world. I was really seeking something, you know, I was, I was looking for something and it was around the same time I was, I started my, my personal growth and transformation and, you know, I started hanging out with them more and, you know, to me, they're, they're good guys. They're great guys. Yeah. You know, before they got into that world, they were always there for me. They just stepped into that, that biker scene. Um, so I was looking for, something to make me feel part of something you know make me feel alive more and you know it's like well i would sort of suit this life i don't ride a bike but i can learn i'm quick to violence i'm pretty street smart i can organize you know any other thing if i needed to organize and it sort of was starting to make sense i was like got good mates in there they're always at my back I'm good with my hands. I'm quite smart. Like maybe, maybe that's what I'm looking for. So I, I think it was more the brotherhood of joining that where I was, I was just seeking to be belonging, part of something. Right? Yeah, belonging. Um, yeah. But yeah, when when it come down to it, like I, I didn't go down that path. Like, and you know, I've I've got mates who are, are still in that world, and they've they've never pressured me and. We bump into each other every once in a while and it's shake hands. How are you going? How's your family? And, you know, there's that mutual respect. And, um, but yeah. How old were you when you were constant, when you were deciding whether you do that or not? I was about 22, 23. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So still a fairly young man then. Yeah. Still fairly young, but experienced so much by then, you know? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, and up until this point of before you start your personal development, you change, uh, you wanting to change your route and the direction we're going to go in. If you could put a number on the amount of fights you've entered, because I feel like we've we've probably missed a lot of scenarios here. What would be the ballpark figure? Would you say of the amount of fights? Because I, I could probably count my fight fights on on one hand in my life. You know, I've been punched in a basketball game. Obviously, didn't really go into a fight. I just got punched because he was jealous. I was a great basketball player. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and that was a basketball final, actually. And it's the only time I've been punched in the face. Um, I'm, you know, so I can count, but I don't feel like you could count. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. But if you could put, <laughs> if <laughs> if you could put a ballpark figure onto it, though, where would you think that would sit? Ah, uh, honestly, Andrew couple hundred yeah wow. it was literally every weekend if not twice a, a week you know mm. it was um a lot so 
Yeah. Um, well, if I go yeah, out, I, need, I, I probably will want someone like you around me. <laughs> to be fair. Um, like, so yeah, yeah. easily was, every week was at least one fight. So it's, it's hundreds, you know what I mean? And yeah, it's, mm, I don't remember Do most you... of them because alcohol Ooh. was involved. Okay. So, yeah. So did alcohol play a part in that then? How, how did alcohol change your, your mentality to reality, I suppose? Alcohol made me worse because I lost that self-control. Um, it's, yeah, it got to a point where that drunk me, I just didn't want to be that person anymore. Like I would wake up and I would have blood on me. I'd have a ripped shirt, I'd be missing one shoe. And, you know, I'd be like, oh, that's not my blood or, you know, I'd, I'd maybe spewed all over my bathroom or something like that. And, and it was happening almost every weekend, second weekend. And I just had enough. Like, it, it just become very scary waking up and obviously noticing that I'd been into a fight, not knowing if I'd won or who the other person was. And then working in construction at the same time and waking up every second weekend like that because we only get, you know, every 14th day off. So you would write yourself off that 13th night and then it's like, okay, who did I hurt? Like I'd leave my small donga in my room and I'd be walking to get something to eat. And I'm like, is it any of these people? Like, are they looking at yeah. me? Because, and um, yeah. Drunk LJ, yeah, everyone knew to be very careful around drunk LJ because there was no self-control there. Uh, there wasn't me. I wasn't able to hold myself back. Like, there was just any excuse and I would fire off. Were you ever scared of doing it going too far? You know, was was killing anyone ever in the picture? Did it ever get to that? level of no, thinking you, you you've done that you I, might have done that if you can't remember a fight you know what i mean yeah yeah look honestly i look back and i am just you know guardian angels have watched over me because some of the fights the way i've I've hit people could have been a lot worse you know you, you hear about these one punch stuff and hmm. you know even though we're fighting when I make that connection, when they fall back, it could have easily gone the wrong way. And I'm very grateful that, um, you know, well, very thankful that it never happened that way for myself. It, it was more like, hey, heard you and so and so had a fight on the weekend. It's like, yeah, I feel like, yeah. He's yeah. okay. He's just battered. He's got yeah. a sore head or something like that. So, yeah. When you, when you hit somebody and you could see them, what, what, what feet, what did you feel? What, what, came, you know what I mean? Like I remember doing it to someone who would piss me off so much. I've done it once in my life. I actually felt pretty good in the moment, but I remember 20 minutes later, I was fucking trying to say sorry to the highest level and he didn't want a bar of it, but I felt really bad after about 20 minutes. Yeah. What did you go through? Um, in my younger years, I would feel like a sense of, I just remember always checking over to see if it had been sort of seen like in practice or, or, tra or training and stuff like that. Or I'd always look mm -hmm. over to see, did my dad see that punch or, um, you know, how, how has this been received? And if they're happy, I'm happy. Uh, but as I got older, Honestly, nothing, because when you switch off all emotions and when I hit someone and it's nothing new, it's just another day, yeah. I, I don't feel any. I wouldn't feel anything. Um, it'd be like, is he going to get back up or is that enough to deter him? Like that punch was pretty hard. He's still standing, but he's. I can see in his eyes he's second guessing this right now. So it's yeah. like, okay. You want to go again? And I, I don't feel any, I, I wouldn't feel anything because it was just another day. Mm. Yeah, wow. You, you, you said your mum was a very uh, loving person. How would she show that love to you growing up? 
she would she would come out and when we're training and my father's you know had us out there for too long it was our mum that would always come and save us whether we're at the park or in the backyard she would poke her head out and be like that's enough and that uh, you know and that's a lot to a young kid that's been crying the whole training session that's hurting that doesn't want to be there and you know when you see your mum and you know it's about to end you're just like oh, thanks mum like honestly thank you <laughs> um and, and mum always her love language was always food with us you know it's like I, I I don't recall hearing my mum or my father say I love you growing up. Um, but I always knew my mum loved us. I never was too sure if my father loved us or loved me. But um, just my mum's presence, you know, it's just, of course mum loves me. Like, look how dad treats me. <laughs> if that's not love, then what is it? So, yeah. yeah. Has she ever told you as an adult? Yeah, as an adult, as an adult. Yeah. Yeah, same as my father. You, yeah, we got to a point. When did he tell you he loved you? Uh, when I was 19, we were both drunk. And, yeah, you know, it's it's funny the things you remember. And I, I remember it so clearly because it's like, wow, it's the first time he's ever said that. And then as a 19-year-old, ponder on it, ponder on it, days and weeks, I was like, did he only say that because... He was drunk. Hmm. It's like he actually said he he loves, and you know my other best mates that were there. He's like, well, he said he loves them too, and that person. And you start thinking about it. He's like, does he really love me? If he said it to the other people, so yeah, I was I was, I was nineteen years old. And we were drinking, and you know he was he was a happy man. Like we got through our we're getting through our teenage years, and I had good friends around me that. You know, my, my friends, we've all been day ones since we were like eight, nine years old. So we're still close mates now. So, yeah. yeah. As he said it, since you were 19. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, since he moved back to the islands, probably only the last, uh, probably, you know, I want to say five years, but time's moving fast. So maybe the last 10 years. I remember there was an awkward moment, awkward moment over the phone. And he was like, love you, mate. And it's just like, what the hell is that? Like, so it was like too awkward. Like, I was awkward. He was awkward. And I was like, oh, I love you too, Dad. And it was just felt so <laughs> alien and felt so awkward. And it was yeah. like, okay, got to go. Bye. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I sort of picture, you know, in the movies, how like two young kids, a boy and a girl, I saw her on the phone for the first time and one of them blurts out, I love you. And then yeah, it's just yeah. silence and awkward. It's like, oh, I've got to go. And that's how that's how I sort of remember it. It's just like, okay. Did, but, you know. Did you mean it, it when time. you replied? I did. Yeah, I did. But it's just awkward to say the words, right? Yeah, exactly. To say it in your mind is one thing and to say it out loud um this definitely took me by surprise. So, yeah. Yeah. I relate to that. I do. Mm. Yeah, no, it's sad, isn't it? Yeah, you, you can't help but love the people who are connected to you in, you know, blood some some way, but just because you feel it doesn't necessarily mean you can articulate it the way you want to. Right, you know, it's a tough one. You, we, we've, we've, I feel like we've come towards the end of our uh younger years teenage up to 22 it before we move on though is there anything that you think that needs to be painted about you your character events of your life before we start to go into your adult life and and, and see that change of your persona into the character that you are today uh the only thing would be that i would always uh, there was always two LJs, you know, like for the people I got close to, they got to know that there was always two LJs, like softly spoken LJ, really nice guy. Even like my mate's parents would be like, oh, he's such a 
good kid, nice kid. Um, so there was always two LJs and there was always that that conflict of like who you or who 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 I wanted to be, you know, like I was the other LJ because that's what I felt like I needed to be accepted in my in my family, in the masculine world of my family. But there was, you know, my parents instilled a lot of respect in us for our elders, for family, for people we love. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always a respectful person and I was always that really good mate. But I was also that real hard ass that if you mess with me or the people I love, then expect the worst. I'll come down on you. So, and, I, and that's what I really struggled with, um, having those two identities because they just didn't match that one, that one person. Like, how, how even to integrate that? Like, you can't. Yeah. So it's one or the other. Yeah, I can see that. And what happens if did ever this has just come to me? But did um, a, even somebody that you loved or um, a, a friend ever cross you? Cross me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my brothers did. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it sucks because I treated him like shit. You know what I mean? Um, and not just to him, but in front of everyone, you know, I demanded a full respect. Like, uh, I had him, we were at a party, something happened, and um, in in the haste of things, whether he was trying to take off to a fight real quick, I can't remember what it was, but he had to take off real quick, and he jumped in the car and told the, the car to take off, and they ran over my foot, um, oh. and that really pissed me off, so when they come back, I was still pissed off, and the boys were like, bro... He did this to LJ, he's pissed off, man. And, you know, my brother, even though he was my older brother, he sort of knew, like, shit, man, like, this is LJ we're talking about, and he's drinking. So he full went submissive in front of the party and just went down on his knees and asked for forgiveness. And wow. to and went full submissive and just gave me that respect because he didn't want it to escalate to where it could have gone. And, you know, he, he bowed down, got on his knees, bowed down. He was like, I'm sorry, bro, sorry. And then, you know, that's for me where I was like, <laughs> you know, oh, okay, I, I accept that. But, yeah. you know, Did and, you, I mean, back, you that, that, that's it. tough because, you know, I love my brother so much. But back in those days when you're trying to create an identity and, you know, there's like 50 people at this party, probably 100 people at this party, and, and he's – allowing himself to be vulnerable and submissive like that. So I don't rage out like, yeah, yeah, it's, wow. it's it, hard to it, think back on. Oh, so you struggle to think about that scenario, do you? Yeah, because it's, you know, like now that I've learned empathy, now mm. I'm allowed to, I can place myself in his shoes back then, or I can think of my actions, how I do now. And I'm like, man, that sucks for my brother, for what he had to do to ensure that, you know, I didn't hurt him or, you know, that for him to feel like that's what he had to resort to, you know, it's like, he's my blood, like, so, yeah. Yeah, well, he obviously felt the need to do that because he, he, he would have based it on his previous experiences of seeing you rage or let loose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that, man. That that's uh you put yourself in a vulnerable situation to even share that as well, so I appreciate it. Um have you ever had a traumatic experience? I I know you I know you miscarriages and we've mentioned before, but outside of that, have you ever had any other traumatic experiences? Oh, uh. My childhood was traumatic. <laughs> I think we've covered that. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, oh, I, know. I, I can't think of anything else besides my childhood at the moment. Sure. Like, yeah, okay. You know, the more we think about my childhood, the more things that should come up of just silly things I've done. Yeah. Um, and, and, and is there anything that you want to share before we move on? Because I'm about to ask you about a role model, but is there anything else that you want to, to share before we move on? You feel like you're uh, happy look, with just, what you've covered? Yeah, I think the more stuff I, I share is more just painting or reaffirming that person I was as a youngster that was, you know, just out of control, but also, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the and, and I think we've just, summed that up. I think yeah, I think we sum that up, and I and I want I want mm. to change the direction of the episode now, then because yeah. you're a really amazing person, and I've really enjoyed being a part of your family. And uh, for the last couple of months, I've felt we've communicated quite frequently, and and I feel like a bit of a brother to you now. And if you ever come over to Melbourne, we, we're going to hang out for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd love that. I really would. Role models. Yeah. Who would you say your role model was? In your life, growing up, adulthood, whatever, who who was your role model? Uh, in my younger years, you know, it was just the older men in my life because how I seen like my uncles and older brothers behave is what I assumed what a man was meant to be. You know, mm. hard, strong, fearless. Um, quick to anger and stuff like that. But um, as I started to transition into, I guess, adulthood in my early 20s, I started construction when I was 19. Um, I, I pursued the rugby career, but unfortunately had uh, a career-ending injury in Queensland. So I, I moved back to Perth when I was 19. And I started construction. I was, I was very lucky. Um, one of my best mates got me a job. Um, and it, it was through construction where I started to see different personalities and identities. And what I began doing is just grabbing bits of what I liked about certain men and sort of trying to shape the man that I wanted to become because not one man had the life or the way I wanted to to live or, or become. I just seen little things that each person was doing that I wanted to. I was like, I like that. I want to adopt that into uh, how I run teams or how I live my life. So I, I can't really, you know, say I had one role model. I had many that influenced influenced me in a way that got me to where I am today. Where was one of those two men in your life positioned in your life? Was it a boss or was it a community yeah. member like you, what you're doing to those young men? Yeah. The, the first one that comes to mind, he was a boss, one of the, the top bosses for the company. And mm -hmm. what I really loved about him was that he wasn't a physically strong or hard man, like the usual men I was used to. But the respect he got from the type of men that I'm used to, really, it really threw me off because I'm like, he's nothing like us. Like, why, why are you giving him all this respect? Like, he doesn't look like he fights. He doesn't look like anything that I've been taught what a man should be. Yeah. But um, everyone respected him a lot. He, he, and that's when I started to realize, I was like, they're not afraid of him. They actually respect him. Like, so looking at him and sort of paying attention more to how he would behave when he was on site, you know, just the simple things of how he would remember everyone's first names. And, you know, this is Australia. No one calls each other by their first names. Everyone has a nickname, but he would yeah. always call everyone by their first names and he would get to know you and, you know, what are your hobbies? Do you have family? How are you? How are your kids? And he would always give you that five minutes. And I would always be watching and paying attention. And um, so my, my 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 real name is is Livy. I'm named after my father. So maybe that's why my father was a bit harder on me. But um, 
every time I seen him, he'd just be like, oh, hi, Livy. He was like, how's your dad? Because he'd worked with my dad before. Like, yeah, no, my dad's good. And, you know, he would take interest in my life and then he, he would carry on. And I would just notice, I was like, man, he knows every single person on site's first name and he knows at least one thing about that person. So as I started to step into leadership roles, I started to um, model sort of just that behavior where I'd learn their first names and I'd try to learn at least one thing about them so we could have that personal touch where it was more than, hey, you finished this job. It was like, hey, how's your wife? Or, hey, did you go fishing? Did you get that boat? Yeah. So just those little things. So, yeah, he's the first one that comes to mind. But, but most of the, yeah, nice. the role models that I started to look up to were always in a higher level than me, in some leadership role anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And other part, so, because other parts of your life, not that we want to keep going back onto your, we're well, not talking about childhood, but even your adulthood, you've had, you've experienced a, a, a quite a few, I would say, traumatic experiences from what I've learned of from Sherelle and yourself on our previous chats. Adulthood hasn't always been easy as well uh, before you met Sherelle, has it? You've had, you've no. had a few difficult scenarios there as well. I mean, do you want to go down that road? Because I'm obviously I don't want you to if you don't want to. Um, but in terms of your you 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 lost a family member as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I lost my nephew um, around the same time myself and Sherelle uh, met. So yeah, that was a, that was a tough one for me. Um, like I've, I've I've lost come from a big family. I've I've lost people before, but. To lose someone that close was really, was really raw, um, and I was sort of taken by surprise. Even though I I knew he had um, the health issues he, he's he's had his whole life. He was born with um, a, a heart disease, but yeah. uh, I just wasn't expecting him to to go so young. So yeah, that that was. That was a tough one. Did did um how old was he when he lost his life? He was about sixteen. Fuck it's so young, right? Jesus. Mm -hmm. How how did that impact the family? It's uh Yeah. It brought us closer. Um but yeah, it, it was it was hard on the whole family, you know. Um, I'm, I'm very blessed that our culture we have a, a very beautiful way of grieving and of saying goodbye. Um, so you know, the body comes back to our home, and we we set up a room where we can sit with the body and we can say our goodbyes and we can sleep with the surf around nephew or sleeping next to our nephew for you know the, the next week and we're able to grieve in that way to be with him and to tell him stories and that was um that helped a lot but it was still like just makes you realize how i guess mortal we are at the end of the day <laughs> yeah wow so that I didn't realize that happened in the culture where so the body stays with you for the for the week, does it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't. Oh. It, it's it's normalizing death. Mm. Yeah, it makes and, sense um, when you say it when you say it like that, and and being able to talk to them, I, I can see it. I just can't imagine myself doing it. It's weird. I don't. Yeah, it, but that helped you, and as long as it helped you, it doesn't really matter, does it? I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You know, for a lot of my mates who are Aussie and they, they come and I sort of had to let them know, I was like, just to let you know, uh, my nephew's in the next room. And they're like, yeah, that's yeah. cool. And, it, and you know, they'd, they'd known him since he was a baby too. So to give them their, their space where it's just they can have their one-on-one -on time, one -on -one time and they can – grieve openly and cry and talk and you're not holding anything in it's just you get to say goodbye to this vessel that you've known for so long but they may not be in there but 
it's you're not holding on to anything you know you're in there you got that that room to yourself and you can solve you can do what needs to be done it's it's um yeah it's a beautiful thing yeah so i feel i feel like i know the answer to this question but there was a pivotal part in your life you were going through a relationship and there was a pivotal part uh, that really changed. Well, I'm, I suppose I'm putting words into you, you, your mouth here and I might be completely wrong, but there was a pivotal part in your life where you started to change your journey for the better. Was that yeah. the point where you met Sherelle or had the journey already started? The journey had already started um, by the time I met Sherelle. Uh, mm-hmm. I was in construction and once again, I'd woken up with blood on my shirt, spew in my bathroom, and I just remember thinking to myself, and I look, and I remember looking in the mirror and just saying to myself, how much more can you take of this? Is this what you want for the rest of your life? Is this the man that's going to raise your children, that's going to find the wife that you want one day and it was it was you know i had to have that conversation with myself another two or three times or maybe another dozen times to check in again and be like you're here again what are we doing we've got to do something so yeah it was i didn't want to be that person anymore i wanted to be more and i didn't want to bring children into my life being that person so i i knew big things had to change and 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 you're right big things do need to change and they did need to change but doing the big changes suddenly doesn't tend to work out so i'm guessing you took your own advice that you give to those boys now you made small changes am i correct or did you just did you make a big change or was the small sudden change small changes that you made yeah, small changes, small changes. You can't just get rid of an alcohol habit overnight, a drug habit overnight. Um, you know, your anger issues don't disappear. So for me, it was like, I'm laying off alcohol, I'm doing this and that. And, you know, it always brought me back to, um, back into the trouble that I was getting into because it, it was near on impossible trying to do everything at the same time. So, For me, it's like, okay, I'm not doing shots anymore because shots, I tend to lose myself and I forget what happens in the night. So I'm still going to drink, but I'm not doing shots anymore. But I'm going to train. I'm training. I'm focusing on my physical body. So I started training three days a week and then I increased that to four days a week. And when I first started off, I would get off the bus from work. I would go to the gym and then I'll go to the pub and have my, you know, three or four drinks with the boys and I'd go to bed. And it took me a while creating that habit of going to the gym that uh, before long, you know, uh, it got to a point where it's like, I'm really loving this, this routine of going to the gym. So, you know, I'd stop going to the pub as much, you know, go to the pub seven days a week and then I drop it down to five days a week and then from five days a week I'm going there a couple of days a week but I'm still training and then it's it's like just just slowly slowly making those changes so for me it's like what do I know I know how to create um a, a healthy body physically because that was the, my upbringing was training always training 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 so I went back into training and I started to just really look after my physical health. And, you know, at the same time, I was still drinking, occasionally doing drugs. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.